I'm Connor McMahon, Senior Curator for the Indian Arts and Crafts Board and oversee the Native American collections here at the museum. It seems like we have a lot of new faces uh, in the room today, so for those of you who haven't been to Turtle Soup before, welcome. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone, uh, especially our regulars, for an incredible season um, and for coming back and supporting the museum as we uh, uh, revive Turtle Soup. It's been a lot of fun for the staff here and we've enjoyed having you here. And uh, this will be our last presentation for the season, but look for us to come back even bigger and better this fall with a whole new slate of programs. Um, just a reminder, if everyone could please turn off cell phones before we start the program, that'd be wonderful. Um, and the soup is again provided by Fork Real Cafe. They've done a wonderful um, job of providing soup and I hear today's is maybe the best we've had all spring. So um, they're, thank you. So that's a great organization with a wonderful mission. So if you'd like to support them, um, please do so. Uh, we have a fantastic presentation today with Jim Anderson, um, who's going to talk about the history of Igloo and the Black Hills Ordnance Depot. Depot. Um, Jim grew up in Igloo. Uh, he graduated from Provo High School and then went on to school at South Dakota School of Mines, where he uh, received a degree in mechanical engineering. And he's been involved with the Provo High School alumni organization for over 25 years and is South Dakota's resident expert on the history of Igloo. So I think we're gonna have a great program. Let's give them a big hand. Yeah, first, can everybody hear me in the back there? Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. First, I wanna welcome all the people here in person and uh, I know there's a few of my friends that signed up for Zoom, so wel welcome to them too. Uh, see if I can get through 40 minutes of this. And uh, four years ago, there was an article in the Edgemont Herald Tribune that the Hot Springs Bison were going to the state basketball tournament. It had been 74 years since they had been there, and so there's a lot of it, a lot of hype going on. There's a little sidebar on the page that pointed out only five teams from Fall River County had ever gone to state and Hot Springs was two of them. Who were the others? Number three was the Provo Rattlers in 1954, coached by Vic Jarvis. And see if we can get this to advance here. Something's not working. There we go. And they uh, made it all the way to the championship game and lost to Haiti. Team number four, Provo Rattlers, again, three years later, coached by Jack Eklund. And the last team was the Provo Rattlers again, three years later, in 1960, coached by Charles Gustafson. So we had three different teams from Provo High School, went to state in a six year span, coached by three different coaches. And spoiler alert, Hot Springs went again this year, so it's Hot Springs three, Provo three. <laughs> I think Hot Springs will probably come out ahead. This school banner is probably at the, uh, all the tournaments. And it's this banner, it's right back here. And this is not the first time this banner has been in this room. 19 years ago, it was part of Bob Laskowski's sports exhibit. Seven out of the eight teams in the state tournament were from uh, eastern South Dakota, and only the little Provo Rattlers clear down in the corner there were, was the only one in the western South Dakota. So most of the, most of the sports writers knew very little about the Provo Rattlers, especially that first year. And uh, the Provo Rattlers played fast break, run and gun offense, and full court 
press defense, and they were a, a favorite of the fans, fans because it was a much more exciting games. And the fact that they made it all the way to the finals caught the attention of the sports writers. They did struggle a little bit with the, on the banner here, you got Provo High School, you got BHOD, you got Igloo, South Dakota, you know, what does that all mean? That's a little confusing. So I'll try to explain that, but uh, first we'll start with where it was located. As I said, it was in the southwest corner of South Dakota, probably the furthest from, well, it is the furthest high school from here in their Aberdeen area where they held the tournaments. This gives you an idea of relationship to Rapid City, Hot Springs, and Edgemont. Here, a close up for Edgemont, Ardmore. You have a uh, And uh, the white outline there is, is the, the border of the uh, Ordnance Depot, Black Hills Ordnance Depot, which is what the BHOD stand, stood for. It was uh, four miles from Wyoming and nine miles from Nebraska. From Igloo to Edgemont is about, about eight miles. This, you can see the outline of the the depot, Provo on the outer edge, and Igloo just inside of the, of the boundary. And on the left side there, you can see where all the, uh, the Igloos were. This is another close-up showing uh, the community of Igloo and the relationship to Provo and uh, again, the, the railroad is what uh, the border on the right side there was. Okay, I think I got the clicker figured out now. I'm hitting the wrong button. Here you see the, uh, got the main gate, the school, the housing area, the barracks area, the, uh, hospital, the water tower, the officer's housing, and administration building, fire station, and the officer's club. Whoop. I have to keep my fingers off the buttons. Okay, uh, Provo was the first thing to come into existence. The CB and Q Railroad built a line through the corner of South Dakota, and it was the steam in, in 1890. It's still the steam era, so they had to have water, water tanks, and uh, fuel supplies every so every so often along the the track to refuel and. Provo was a perfect site for a, one of these year refueling stops because it was on the, the, high, the high point of the railroad. And Provo was named after uh, Bill Provo Sr., a local rancher. In 1910, the area was open to homesteading and uh, these are the homesteads that were within the boundary of what would become the Ordnance Depot. And as in the olden days, you always had a school section in the middle of the townships. And uh, at Provo, they, uh, they built a soft water school in that section, and then they built another one-room school in Provo proper. And uh, that was uh, the start of the Provo School District. 
by 1942, I, the dirty 30s and the depression uh, diminished the numbers of homesteaders still in the area. They closed the soft water school and there's only 12 students going to the Provo School in the 41-42 year when the, when the depot was uh, starting to be, to be built. The 42-43 school year was, was after the started building and the they had 20 people in Edgemont or Provo before that, and they ended up with hundreds of people. And uh, lots of children from the construction workers, and then uh, later the, uh, the ordinance workers that were hired. And it was very, very fluid up and down. And they had shifts at the Provo with the, this is, this is the, uh, the soft water school, and this is the Provo school. They moved the soft water school into Provo and had split shifts, and then they, they bus students to Edgemont. In the uh, 42, 43 school year, they built an eight-room school on the depot. And then finally, for the 44, 45 year, they uh, added on to that first school there on the depot and uh, started a high school. And 1945 was the first graduating class from Provo High School. Going back to a few years to uh, December 7th, 1941 in the Pearl Harbor, 10 days after that, it was announced that the that an ammunition depot would be built near Provo. And the, uh, the surveyors and the land appraisers and all of those people started coming in the first of the year in 1942. In April and May, they started, thought they'd start the construction and uh, it was the worst Worst spring they ever had. <laughs> Part of the reason they selected uh, that site down there was because it was high and arid and <laughs> there wouldn't be much rust. And they finally got their trestles in and uh, got, some, got some rails laid and by... Uh, By the end of May, they were ready to, to work on the, uh, the main, main mission of the depot was, was storage, storage of ammunition. And uh, within the boundary, which is, uh, this is the boundary here. It's a little over 21,000 acres. They had to build a spur. Oops, wrong button again. Anybody familiar with gumbo mud? Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, we had that. If you're from down south, you eat gumbo, but uh, South Dakota, you don't. Okay, here we go. Uh, we had uh, a spur built in from the main line. And this red is the spur, and they had a loop. And they had, I think they had 21 aprons built around that railroad spur. That was 39 miles. All the black lines were, were roadway. They had 158 miles of road. Uh, this road here was called Lookout Road. And that enclosed the restricted area, and he had uh, 20 miles of man-proof fence that were built around the restricted area. He had uh, 12 above-ground magazines in this area here. 
And this, they were used for like the lower, not the, the high energy explosive, but the lower energy explosive, like fuses and things like that. And here's a, they had a railroad siding go right beside the building and then trucks could back up the ramp or The uh, underground magazine areas, they are called on some of the early blueprints. The military commonly called them igloos. And uh, all the depots they built during the 41, 42 era were limited to 800 or so igloos. You could only have 100 igloos in a block. And at uh, at Black Hills Orange Depot, there were 600 of these were 80 foot, 200 were 60 foot, and uh, two were 40 feet. This wasn't taken at Igloo, but it gives you an idea what the, what the inside of one of those Igloo magazines looked like. This is uh, one of the blocks. You'll notice they're all facing in the same direction. And that was intentional. They didn't want the explosion from the door of one to affect an open door of another one. They had to have 400 feet minimum distance between them. And this is a profile of what an igloo looked like. You had to the floor with the little stub walls. You had an arch, which is about 12 inches wide at the bottom, about six inches wide at the top. You had uh, two feet of dirt on the top, and then it tapered off the sides. And the whole purpose was if there's an explosion, it would blow up and out, or up and not, not out. And even the dirt had to be special. It couldn't be hard dirt, and it couldn't have big stones, and it would turn into projectiles. So they're kind of specific about that. The, from the previous picture, maybe you could judge, but it was about nine feet tall. See, yeah, nine feet and about 20 feet wide. And again, it was 80 foot, 60 foot, and 40 foot. On uh, March 31st, 1950, uh, one of these igloos got tested unintentionally. And there were four men working at, in it at the time, and only one survived, and three were killed instantly. And this is what it looked like after the explosion. The sandbags were probably from the recovery and uh, for the rescue and recovery efforts, but. You can see the arch here, there's part of an arch, there's part of an arch, and another one here. And this is what it looks like today, after they cleaned off all the rubble. and they, uh, The things that I've read about it, there's rifle grenades that were in there that were unstable and and set off the explosion. But here you can see the, uh, the floor and the little side walls were, were still in intact after the explosion. They were, that section was formed as one, one piece and uh, when that was poured, they let it set up and then they started forming for the arches. These are the interior forms being put up. And in the background here, you can see uh, two more igloos being worked on. And these are dirt piles from the dirt that eventually go over the top. And this picture here is probably taken from the dirt pile for this igloo. After they got the interior forms, they put rebar and uh, wire mesh on it, the reinforcement, and they put the outer outer forms on, and they built uh, the front and the rear walls, the forms for them. And then eventually they would uh, 
pour this all as one pour. They'd pour in through these side things and then cover them up and pour through the top and then pour into the end walls. While all that was going on, they had, uh, they were constructing the area for the uh, employees to live while they were working there. And these, these pictures were taken from the derrick for the, for the well. Back here you have uh, single family dwellings, it was later called, that uh, the contractor built for his employees. It's and these were CCC barracks that held like 50 to 100 men in each one. They had a big uh, Olympic mess hall here with three different wings and they fed thousands of workers. This area they had four rows of barracks and a PX and they called us a mobility area. And there's not enough time to go into what that means, but this area here, they had a trailer camp, and this area here is what, it, what I call the, the grain bin site there. These are the houses that Turtling built for his prime employees. Turtling was the prime contractor. And they were built to last the summer. And uh, the, this journal article, they called everything down in Turtle Town. This is a trailer camp. They had a, a what would you call that? Rest, restroom, laundry, shower thing for them and uh, they didn't need to heat the water because the water came out of the well at 140 degrees. We had a water treatment plant but uh, the main thing it did was cool the water. This is what I call the granary area. These were all originally intended to be uh, granaries on small farms and ranches. Yeah, let's see if I can go back here. And the government bought up a whole bunch of them and turned them into little, little houses for the workers. And uh, August, they started pouring the igloos at uh, May 30th. So June, July, and August, they pretty much poured all 800 igloos. This one particular August 27th, they poured 30, 32 of the arches in one 24-hour period. And this set a new record, which was beat the f former record of 24, which was set by the same contractor at Umatilla Artist Depot. And I don't think anybody's beat the record since then, because I don't think anybody's building igloos now. Uh, as a result of this, the uh, contractor and the Corps of Engineers decided to have a big party, and they decided to throw a, an Indian pageant an all day. And they had, uh, I think this article says 2,000 spectators, I think another one said up to like 4,000 people showed up for this. This is, uh, I'll come back to this later and something else, but this is one of the things that they did. And they had the dan dances. And here you can see the dancing with some of the uh, contractors. And this one, he wasn't uh, wasn't turtling, but he was the one under him. He got he got a peace pipe, and uh, turtling, he got a war bonnet. And they they gave him Indian names like Chief Charging Eagle. And 
Now, as they transitioned from construction to, to operation as an ordnance depot, why more and more of the young people are being drafted, and there's a shortage of workers. Francis Case suggested that the Indian reservations would be a good source of labors, and many Indian families came to the depot and, and remained there. Eleanor Roosevelt suggested that women were an untapped source of labor, and the WOWs, or women ordinance workers, were formed. And in 19, November 1942, the first load of ammunition was transported by one of these women ordinance workers called Goldie Lovell, and she transferred the ammunition from the railroad apron to an igloo to, to be unloaded. On the left, you have the, the WOW poster. And on the right is the Rosie the River poster, which is based on the WOWs. You'll notice that uh, Rosie's got polka dots, and uh, the real WOW has uh, what was called flaming bombs, the bombs, the ordnance, uh, the symbol of the ordnance department. And we... And you can see uh, see here the badges. And this is the badge that uh, Millie Hardman had when she was at Igloo. And this is the truck she drove. And uh, most of us can kind of remember what it was like to drive an old truck with, with a, without a synchronized transmission, no power steering, and I'm not sure if they put doors on it in the winter or not. But she had to haul, they said the hardest thing they had to do was haul the men from the work, or from the housing area out to the work site in the back of these trucks. They were more afraid of hurting the men than they were when they was actually transporting the munitions back and forth between the aprons and the igloos. The other source of labor was the Italian POWs. And Black Hills Ordnance Depot had 400 POWs there during the war years. This is a, an excellent book on what it was like for the Italian POWs. You'll notice the, the captives or allies. And uh, at first they, they were within a barbed wire fence and they had MPs, but when Italy surrendered, why they became Italian service units and they were granted freedom to, to wander on the amongst the civilians on the base. These are two Italian POWs. The Igloo magazine was, came out in 1942. And you, you notice this Provo, South Dakota. And it took them two years to uh, finally get the name Igloo. They had been getting their mail through a post office box in Provo. And it, the official mail and the personal mail, and then it was taken out the depot. Finally, in 1944, they were granted a post office, which was built in the bottom floor of one of the barracks. And the, the name Igloo officially became the name of the community. This is uh, Millie Hardman again, when she was uh, Millie Kutzner in 1967. She was the last postmistress of the post office when it closed in April of 1967. Here you can see uh, the school. They were building a new grade school at this time. 
These are a multiplex, sixplex, fourplex buildings. These were duplexes, had a chapel, water plant, and then uh, the barracks areas. This PX later became a, a trading post, grocery store, drug store. We had a swimming pool with a little wading pool in the end. We had a very large theater. And this particular gathering was the employees at a, a safety awards. They had set a record for 200 million man hours accident free. And they had a lot of safety records down there to do. Of course, we, we did have movies there also. May 61 was Ben Hur. They had a, what was it? 11, 11 day run of Ben Hur. They charged $1.35 for adults, or $1.25 for adults, 90 for students, and 50 for children. They also had uh, Jerry Lewis. Of course, everybody's favorite psycho. Butterfield 8 with Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, the Misfits with Clark Gable, Marilyn Monroe. And the favorite of us kids, uh, Brides of Dracula and uh, the Leech Woman. Uh, the regular, regular admission was 50 cents adults, 35 for students, and 20 for children. We had a large community building, had a big gym in one end and then a small gym in another wing and several meeting rooms. Had a four-lane bowling alley and several of the people from Igloo were, became excellent bowlers. Had a golf course. This is not grass, <laughs> that's sand. But several, several excellent golfers came from, from starting on that course, and some of them who are way older than me are still golfing to this day. This is the overhead of the hospital. Had a large water tower in the back here. We had three wards and uh, various other buildings. Had a large fire department. I always liked this picture. They drove the fire truck onto this r trailer that ran on rails. So they could uh, drive, the, drive the truck on the railroad track out to wherever the fire was. They had a chapel, but they didn't get the chapel till I think it was 1945. They uh, tore down a chapel, the theater that was shown previous, and an old mess hall at Camp Hale, <coughs> Colorado, and uh, transported them up to Black Hills Orange Depot and reassembled them. They had a fairly Fairly new standard station towards the end. They had a child care center. They even had an airfield. And you have a long gravel runway, a couple of paved runways, and then another gravel runway. This area is what we call the combat area, this combat supply area, where they uh, stored uh, bomb fins and, uh, and non-explosive. They, they did have uh, small arms ammunition there, but nothing more powerful than that. This is the officer's housing, the hospital and tower, water tower. This is the utilities area. This is the housing area. And Provo would be just off to the right here. Who was at Igloo? Some of you may recognize this young fellow. 
this Tom Brokaw from his book, The Greatest Generation. And he was there in first and second grade. Archie Gilfillan, he was one of the early employees. He worked, uh, he was editor of the Igloo magazine and called Mingo and did various things, but he was well known as an author. And uh, even if you don't like sheep, boy, this, this is an excellent book. One of the finest examples of writing of the generation. Okay, back to this picture. This is uh, Helen Morganti, and she was uh, a teacher at Edgemont, and then she went to work at the depot when, when they started hiring people, and she became the public information officer for the Corps of Engineers. And as part of setting up the pageant, and uh, also her fame as a vocalist, I, she was selected to uh, sing the Indian Love Call during this one skit. She later went on to become a hostess at the Camp Carson and Fort Logan service clubs. And then when the war ended, she went back to the Lee Deadwood area and uh, was a longtime educator in the uh, Lee Deadwood school system. And incidentally, she actually, and she, act, and she wrote the Badger Clark story book that was mentioned in the program a couple of weeks ago. Now this picture says sincerely Helen Morganti, and it's from the Ben Rifle collection. And uh, Ben Rifle turned the, the depot in 55 or so, and the commanding officer, Colonel Wickens, mentioned that his grandfather, uh, or that, that he had never been to South Dakota before, but his mother had grew up at Pine Ridge, or spent some time at Pine Ridge. And so I had to look into that, and it turns out that his grandfather was, was uh, Hugh Gallagher, who was the Indian agent between McGillicuddy and Royer. And there's a lot of, lot of history involved in that era with Wounded Knee. Monty and Lillian Nystrom were some of the first employees. Uh, Monty was foreman with the Corps of Engineers and later the Post Engineers. Lillian worked in the fiscal branch and later with her daughter ran the Post cafeteria and snack bar. Prior to the war, Monty was a foreman in the CCCs. This is from the CCC Museum down at Hill City. And Monty Nystrom on his Lincoln, actually I think it was a Model A. But uh, why would Monty Nystrom have a modified Model A? Well, it turns out that he was the supervisor in the building of the Rock Lookout Tower at Harney Peak. Everybody else had to ride horses and mules or walk up from Sylvan Lake. And, but Monty, Monty had his own transportation. And this is the, some of the workers at, at Harney Peak while they were building it. His son, Scott, was a, a co-foreman, co and this is Scott on the left. You can always recognize him in the pictures from his pith helmet. And on the right, we have Monty Nystrom, and uh, this is most likely Lillian. I don't think she was up there every day, so I think this is just a photo op, especially the way she's dressed. And his, his Model A was only a one-seater, so... I'm not sure how he, how he got her up there. Ah, why was Monty qualified to build the lookout tower on Harney Peak? Well, it turns out he came to the Black Hills 
about 20 years earlier. And uh, Monty Nystrom, a.k.e. M.E. Nystrom, a.k.a. a.k.a. Monroe Nystrom, was one of the three men who came from the Minneapolis area and built the, uh, the game lodge. Monty was the, the stonemason. After uh, Coolidge stayed there for the summer, why it gained a lot of notoriety, and especially this fireplace that uh, Monty built in the, uh, the dining room area where he used a specimen rock from the Black Hills. After that was built, they uh, built the Art Crafters Studio in, in Custer. This building is still standing. I don't know who that tourist is. But <laughs> they, uh, they built the face of the building out of petrified rock. And on the inside, they had this massive fireplace that he built using the specimen rocks. And they also built uh, tourist items using the local uh, specimen rocks, the pegmatites and stuff from the various mines. Now, you don't have to go all the way to Custer or Harney Peak, a.k.a. Black Elk Peak or the Game Lodge to see Monty's work. Uh, this is the Alice Gossage fireplace, which is just over there a little ways in the Pioneer exhibit. And it was, it was probably built, more than likely built by Monty. And the Pat Madison cabin out front. Uh, Monty built the fireplace and uh, chimney for that, and it survived 100 years and, and the move from Haley Park. I had to throw this in there. Those of us who grew up at Igloo hate, the, hate them using Fort Igloo on everything. So I, had to, I never had this shirt made, but I designed it. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes. So I'm everybody. Teacher, I can talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> she's my she's name, my classmate. <laughs> my name is Cecilia Haas, and my parents started working at Igloo in 1942. And one thing that Jim didn't mention that everything that we needed as a human being was provided for us at Igloo. We had schools, we had churches, we had hospitals. We had two bars, yeah. We had a clothing store, a bowling alley. Everything we needed was provided by the government for our existence there, including the Italian War of Camp. My dad used to go eat there. He said they had good food. When we didn't see him, that's where he was. But it was also a place that there was no discrimination no difference from me to you to anybody else that lived there. Because our parents worked together, we lived together, we were such a tight-knit community that everybody knew everybody that lived there. And if our parents didn't, I, Jim didn't talk about this either, but that picture where they show the gate, you know, with the uh, stone fences on the side, if our parents didn't want us to leave Igloo, they would call down to the gate and say, so-and-so is coming through, don't let them through. <laughs> well, guess what we figured out as children? We went to Provo. We followed the railroad track. Went to Provo, went to Edgemont, went to Hot Springs, and we came back the same way. They never knew we left the devil. You know? <laughs> but everything we had was provided for us. Uh, sadly, you know, and, and part of uh, life, that the depot closed in the middle 60s. We weren't the only ones that closed in the 60s. But I remember my brother saying at one point, graduation night, and he was one of the last graduating classes, said the kids would come up, get their diplomas, walk off the stage, and you never saw them again. Because they either went to Oregon, they went to Illinois, they went to Colorado. You didn't see the people anymore. But their parents transferred for those places. But in the beginning, the existence of Igloo, there were over 5,000 people 
who lived there. That's an awful lot of people that lived and worked and played together. So it was, in a way, it was an honor. You know, when he talked about the people who graduated from schools, my goodness, we had some amazing people that went on to, not only with many, many, many teachers came out of that school. Many people went on for masters, doctorates, engineering, you name it, and we did it because of the education that we got at that school. So it was a great place to grow up. Pretty isolated, you know, but it was a great place to grow up. So thank you for letting mm -hmm. me share that. <laughs> great. Yeah. So what is the current uh, status? What's the current status of anybody living there? Or is it being used? Or? There's so the, I'm just going to repeat the okay. question. So the question was, what is okay. the current status of Igloo? Is anybody still living there? Okay, the, the officer's housing area, which is up there by the hospital, is a subdivision called the Igloo subdivision. And there's like 12 lots up there, I think. And uh, there's probably only a handful of them are still occupied up there now five maybe yeah but uh, that's the uh, well there's that group there and then there's the people that own the uh, north half and that where the housing area was they've moved into the old or that new brick schoolhouse is being built and they were going to start a uh, hunting lodge or bread and breakfast and they were going to call it Fort Igloo, which is why now everything's, this road and everything's named Fort Igloo, but that's, and we never were a fort, and, and just the other day I seen somebody call it Camp Igloo. No such thing, it was Igloo. They had, a, we'd have a, a new commanding officer every two years. The military would rotate. And one of them would come in and said, Igloo, that's a terrible name. You should change the name of your community. People, people don't like the name Igloo, you know, I mean, they turned off by that. So they had a big contest in the paper, and the name Igloo won out like 80%, you know. So, uh, and I guess one other thing, the, the survival bunkers out in the, the Igloo area. I'm not sure, I know when I was down there a few years ago, they were, there's a, like a restriction, they couldn't live there in the igloos because they only had the one entrance. So the county, but uh, I guess there's several people who have leased igloos to build uh, survival bunkers. So the question uh, was, do you find specimen rock? Define. 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 <laughs> Define specimen? That's, I was trying to think of what else to call it too, but it's uh, the pegmatites, and the, which is like the various, I don't know if you're familiar with all the, the minerals that are in the Black Hills uh, in the uh, pegmatite mines. There's tourmaline and uh, spodgmaline and and of course the ever-present mica, and, uh, and what's the others? But garnet, uh, felspar was another one that was mined. But, but that's, Monty learned how to get that to stick to like vases and stuff, and well, how to stick to the fireplace first thing, but, uh, but that's, that's what they meant by specimen rock, any of these pretty looking rocks that, that you buy at the rock store that supposedly come from a mine. Well, the question was, what was the size of the graduating class? Okay, I guess I didn't mention other than the, uh, other than the post office closed in April of 67. The school closed in May of 67, and the school district was dissolved. And then the depot itself closed in June 30th of 67. But the last graduating class, we had three students. 
because all of the all of the permanent employees that were there earlier were civil service and they all were offered jobs as Punky said all across the country so that's why it got so spread out is they all went to the new other depots as their job Yeah. Well, not not average. Our this is our class, and it was thirty something, and we were the second biggest. Yeah. For uh, the population went up and down depending on wars. We had World War Two, and then the population went down, and Korean War went up, went down, and so the uh, several of the classes had like fifteen graduates. 63. This will be our 60th reunion this year. <laughs> Bunky doesn't want to let you know that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that the water did not have to be heated because it came out of the ground at 140. Why? Why did it's, it come out of the ground that? Well, it's part of the same thing as hot springs. You know, the the various springs around hot springs are are warm. They're not that hot. But yeah, if you if you go down into the I think it was the Madison Aquifer or something, it was fairly deep they had to drill. And I think Edgemont had the same situation. Their well was, was fairly warm too. It had a lot of minerals in it. So you had to you had to learn to to drink it. But some people swore by it. They, they continued to get it. Uh, one of the wells was used by the Provo Township. I think it's still used by the Provo Township. And several people lived in Provo just so they could continue to drink that water. <laughs> and I don't know if you're familiar with Kidney Springs and Hot Springs across from the Evans Hotel. It's, that's heavily mem mineralized spring, and that's advertised as good for your kidneys. Yeah. People in Provo now. Oh, now three or four maybe. <laughs> There's two brothers that own a car salvage thing, with, uh, so most of the thing is covered with cars. And uh, I don't know. Maybe Daryl knows. I don't think there's. I don't. How many people are in living in Provo now? Not, not many. Yeah, uh, ghost town. Other than other than old cars, why? What what kind of armament did they uh, uh, were they storing there that needed such a sophisticated? So the question uh, was, what kind of armament was being stored there at the depot? Let's see if I can bring this up. Okay. These are 500 pound bombs. And the bombs typically had uh, a fin assembly and usually two fuses, uh, one in the front, one in the back. So they were all in, compo uh, in different pieces. The, the bombs were stored out in the, the igloo magazines. The, the fins were stored in the combat area. And the fuses would have been in the above ground magazines. These are some 4,000 pound bombs. The rings that are on some of them, they had a lug welded onto the bomb that they hung in the bomb bays from. And they used these rings to protect those lugs. And they ran out of uh, steel towards the, as the war started building up and they, they made those out of paper. Uh, let's see. And they gave the public tours out in the, some of the areas. This is my favorite. This is a 10,000 pound bomb. Uh, know, somewhere I guess there was a, name, a number of it. Yet. Well, there's the 10,000 pound. 
And they, they came there in gondola cars. You could you'd get maybe four or five of, or no, three or four in a gondola car. Let's see. These are the bomb fins. And all of these are the fins for the 500 pound bombs. This is a fin for the 10,000 pound bomb. This guy, well, these guys are probably all six feet tall at least. So when you put the fin and the bomb together and you put them on a flatbed and you take them to Rapid City, why, it's quite impressive for Armed Forces Day. I think the article pointed out that, uh, that they mentioned inert somewhere in here. <laughs> Towards the last of it, they, the Nike sites here in Rapid City were actually uh, run by the Army. And they stored a lot of their stuff for those sites down there at Igloo. This uh, is one they were making for a, for a float. The, uh, this part here was a solid, solid propellant booster of which they didn't want to empty out to make this float. And I think this is a mock-up of the, of the warhead part of it. But they put one together for the, uh, for the Fall River County Fair Parade. And these are the girls from the Saddle Club. This isn't a munition, but the blizzard of 49, which is, I guess, over there, they requested from the Army, we need, we need some tracked vehicles so we can get around in snow. And <clears throat> they sent them three, three weasels that were in needed repair. They put together one and they never used it for snow, but they used it for their parades. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Yeah, can we get a show of hands of anybody who lived in Igloo at one time? Four? Four? All right, welcome. How many, how many lived near Igloo? <laughs> near, near Igloo. All right. Well, I'm sure Jim will stick around after the presentation right. if anybody has any more questions. But let's give him a big hand. Thank you.